Okay, good morning to all of you who are here in the class and good morning to those of you who are online. Uh, trust you had a good weekend and uh, we stopped last time with the book of Judges. So now today we would be getting into the book of Ruth. Um, Judges and Ruth have been placed next to each other because Ruth belongs during the period of the Judges. That was the timeline during that time when the judges period was going on that is when the story of Ruth takes place and that is why you have the book of Ruth being placed immediately after the book of uh, judges now as most of us know uh, the book of Ruth is about this lady who is a Moabite uh, she's from the land of Moab and um, she chooses to become part of the Israelite nation and uh, we are also aware that she becomes the great grandmother of King David. Uh, so this is her story. And so even as we begin this, maybe we could first look at what God had to say about Moabites in the first place. And he did not have anything positive to say regarding them. Okay, so uh, that makes it very interesting. Here is a story which talks about Ruth in a very, very positive manner. But who is she? What is her background? She is a Moabitess, someone that the a, a, a people group against whom God's judgment had been already declared and spoken. So, if we could maybe turn in our uh, Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter twenty-three, verses three to six, if we could have one person here in the class read it out, and those of us who are online, if we can just follow the these verses in our Bibles, Deuteronomy chapter twenty-three. Verses 3 to 6. very clear wording it says nobody no more but even up to the 10th generation may enter the assembly of the lord and also it says in the in verse 6 do not seek a treaty of friendship with them as long as you live very strong wordings and here is this lady who is a Moabite. And so uh, we need to keep these verses in mind, even as we look at this particular story. Um, so we are we're kind of familiar with how the story begins. Uh, you have Elimelech, who takes his two sons and uh, his wife, and they go to the land of Moab. God has so clearly instructed, saying, do not seek a treaty of friendship with them as long as you live this man is not only um, thinking of friendship he's actually going and settling among them and then after going and settling over there in moab against god's commandment he even gets his sons married to moabite women okay so uh, if we remember when we did the book of judges we are the wording that we read over there i think in four different places where it was mentioned um, everyone did whatever they felt was right in their eyes. Whatever they felt like doing, they went ahead and did it. And they had no regard for the Lord's commandments and what God had uh, desired. So here is Elimelech. He is trying to escape a famine. And he knows very clearly that God does not want them mixing with the Moabite people. Yet, he chooses to take his family and he goes there. And he goes to the extent of marrying his sons to Moabite women. That is the extent of the disobedience, which was very common in the time of the judges. But then, of course, we see how things turn. Um, you know, Elimelech, uh, who went away from the land of Israel to escape from the famine, to escape from death, he dies. His two sons die as well. And now only you have uh, um, Naomi left with the two daughters-in-law. And uh, so uh, right in the beginning of the book of Ruth, uh, she gives them permission to go back to their, uh, you know, um, to their 
native places wherever they have come from uh, because uh, she points out that if they come with her she has no money she has no um, you know um, well established home so if they come back with her she has nothing to provide them and uh, so she uh, being a kind, probably a very kind hearted lady uh, because she could have imposed her, you know, um, her rights as the mother-in-law and said, you have to come back with me. You have, you know, made a covenant of marriage. You chose to enter into our home. Now you you have to be with me. You have to come back with me. She could have said that. But even though she's all alone in the world now, in her kindness, she tells these two young ladies, go back to your homes. You know, now that you're widowed, you can marry again. You can have a life once again. So she gives them permission to go back. And um, um, one of them decides to do exactly that. And we should not really criticize her for going back. Because after all, it would be a very difficult thing for her to come all the way to the land of Israel. It's, it, it would be a new language. It would be a new culture. Um, none of her family would be there no known relatives she would be in a completely foreign land and she would be with an old lady who has no money in her pocket and uh, no provisions so actually it's a very hard life and so one of the daughters in law uh, you know thinks about the whole thing in a sensible way and she decides i think it's better if i go back to my own people i can get remarried once again and i can have a life and we should not you know grudge her for wanting to do that on the other hand, you have this other person, Ruth. She looks at this old lady who's going to be completely helpless, who's not going to have any means of supporting herself. So she thinks, how can I leave her? How can I abandon her? I must go with her and share her sorrows. And so we have this uh, Ruth, who is such a beautiful example of loyalty and love. And so she chooses to come to this strange new land along with her mother-in-law, even though this would be an entirely new place. And the greatest thing is that when she goes over there to the land of Israel, she knows that nobody is going to lay down the red carpet for her because she is a Moabitess, someone that they look down upon, someone that they pass comments about, someone that they, you know, that they treat badly when you go out in public. So she knows that she's not going to be, receive a warm welcome in spite of knowing all of that, she chooses to come over here uh, to Bethlehem along with, um, along with her mother-in-law, Naomi. And the God who is watching from above sees her attitude, sees the heart that, he, uh, that she has, and he begins to prepare and plan a future for her. He allows a series of coincidences to fall into place, which will lead her into a future where she can have um, uh, you know, a home once again, where she can have a family once again. So um, the decisions that we make, people may notice or not notice. They may appreciate or not appreciate. But there is someone above who watches, who sees these things, the sacrifices which are made silently inside the heart. You know, um, they're not they're not anything great or big, but God notices and God makes arrangements accordingly. So we see this very beautiful opening. And this is how the story of Ruth opens. Now, um, you know, just for us to uh, go over some details regarding the book of Ruth before we get into other details. Um, we um, observe in Judges chapter 3 verses 12 to 30 where it talks about how there was um, there were not very good relationships between the Moabites and the Israelites, um, especially in Judges chapter 3, where you have um, the king of Moab, Eglon. He uh, oppresses the Israelites. He treats them very badly. And in fact, their suffering is so bad that finally God you know, decides to send them a judge named Ehud, who will deliver them from the hands of Eglon, the king of Moab. And so uh, relationships between the Moabites and the Israelites were not good. And then, of course, Ehud comes along and he is able to uh, you know, um, kill the king of Moab. And it says in verse 30, that day Moab was made subject to Israel and the land had peace 
for 80 years. So after a battle, after uh, Israel is able to once again subjugate Moab, then there is peace for some time. So we're not exactly sure when Elimelech takes his family and goes over there, but obviously he must have gone at some point of time when peaceful relationships had been restored between Moab and Israel. That's basically when Elimelech uh, goes and settles down in Moab. So uh, coming to the genre of this book of Ruth, obviously most of it is a narrative because it's a story that's being written. Uh, but we also have one other form of writing, which is the genealogy at the very end of the book of Ruth. Coming to the author, um, some people say that it, Samuel maybe wrote it, but the general agreement is that um, it must have been written by somebody during the time of David, uh, because David is mentioned by name at the end of the book. So if David was not yet alive, his name could not have been mentioned. So obviously the book would have been written sometime during his lifetime, uh, you know, during um, the, the kingship of David. So maybe one of the royal court writers, one of the royal court scribes would have probably written down, uh, you know, about his background. Now, um, David would not have been very happy on having his background highlighted because he does not come from a noble lineage of Israelites. He is a mixture of an Israelite and a Moabite. So it's not exactly a very honorable background. And so God deliberately, specifically wanted this particular story written down, which is why we find it in the Bible. If David could have his choice, I'm sure he would not have had this story written out, but God wanted it recorded. God wanted it written down. And so um, David's mixed lineage is exposed for everyone to see uh, when this, um, when this uh, record of his ancestry is written out. Um, what else can we see? Um, maybe we can look at, um, you know, the in, the in the very last portion, Ruth chapter 4, verse 7, it talks about a custom which is being explained, you know, a sandal being exchanged, uh, you know, the sandals which people wear, the footwear that is being given to another person. And so the writer who is writing that gives an explanation of why that particular custom was followed. He's giving an explanation in that particular verse, chapter 4, verse 7, which indicates that when the story was written down, that custom had stopped. It was, a, it was a custom which had happened many, many, many years ago. And so now when he's writing this story for his current readers, he has to explain to them that there, that, that, that there was such a custom and what was the meaning of that custom. So we get an idea that this book was written rather late, you know, sometime maybe during the last years of David's life or, or something like that. So many, many years have passed by and people are no longer familiar with the customs which were there in Ruth's day. Okay, so all this kind of gives us an idea of when this particular book would have been written. Um, and um, yeah, we see that... Uh, God chooses to uh, record this story about how uh, a Moabite, how a Gentile is being included in the Israelite family. And also we see the same thing being done with other people. Tamar and Rahab are, are the other two examples of Gentiles who are um, you know, mentioned as being part of Israel. And moreover, we see that these uh, ladies also become part of Christ's genealogy. They are part of the genealogy of Jesus, uh, you know, leading up to his birth. So God chooses to include Gentiles in the genealogy of the Messiah, which means he does not have anything against Gentiles in general. The, you know, the directive that he gives in Deuteronomy chapter 23 about the Ammonites and the Moabites, it's only up to the 10th generation. He is willing to allow them to have a second chance beyond that if they wish. Of course, we see that there's an exception made over here regarding Ruth. We will come to that later. Uh, but 
basically the point that we see is that God does not have anything against the Gentiles. He judges each people group according to what they have done. So the Moabites and the Ammonites chose to behave in a particular way and they were judged for that. It does not mean that God hates all Gentiles. So which is why we see him always being open to people who are willing to come to him and who are willing to submit to him. If anyone is willing to submit to him, he is open to taking them you know, into his fold. Uh, we see that very, very clearly displayed. Mm. We could also maybe uh, look at the contrast that we see between the book of Judges and the book of Ruth. In the book of Judges, you have story after story filled with people who are so faithless, who are so disloyal, uh, who uh, have no set of values, who are living any way that they wish. And over here in Ruth, on the other hand, you see people who are of integrity, people who show loyalty and commitment towards others. And so we see a great contrast. And the real irony of the whole thing is that in the book of Judges, that's the people of Israel, God's own people who are behaving so badly. And here in the book of Ruth, you have an outsider showing these Israelites how a person should actually live. So that's the really sad state of affairs where it took an outsider to come and show these people how they should really be live, uh, how they should live and what exactly loyalty means, what exactly integrity means. So uh, we see that um, ironical contrast between these two books. Uh, coming to the structure of the book of Ruth, uh, we chapter one, of course, is the opening where you get to know that Naomi has now lost her husband and her sons. And um, uh, she decides to return back to the land of um, Bethlehem. And then in chapter 2 is where you have uh, a Ruth uh, who goes into the fields of Boaz because Naomi advises her to go over there and collect the grain which has fallen on the ground. Now, again, this is a custom which we see referred to in uh, Deuteronomy, was it? either it's in Numbers or Deuteronomy, where it talks about how uh, the people who have land, who have crops, they should show mercy to people who don't have any land. So when they are gathering the crops at harvest time, if, the, if, any, if any of the crop falls on the ground while they are gathering it, they should leave it there on the ground so that the poor people can come later and pick up the leftovers. They're not supposed to be so greedy uh, and so miserly that they pick up every little last bit and don't leave anything for the poor. So it was it was a it was a commandment that God gives to the Israelites, saying that during harvest time, when you are gathering your crops, anything that falls to the ground, leave it there. Let the poor people come and gather it later so that they too can have food. So um, Naomi and uh, Ruth are now in this category. They are the poor people. They have nothing. They have no. They have no land. Nothing. And so Naomi advises and says, "Why don't you go to Boaz's farm? Because uh, that, that he's supposed to be a relative of ours. He may show more mercy and kindness. So why don't you go over there and gather the um, the grain which has fallen onto the ground? So which is why uh, we see those details in chapter two. Then of course in chapter three. Um, Naomi again advises Ruth to go to Boaz and you know, make a demand that he fulfill the duties of a kinsman redeemer and uh, Boaz uh, agrees to help. So that would be chapter 3 and of course in chapter 4 uh, we have um, the marriage of Boaz and Ruth taking place and they have a son Obed who becomes the grandfather of King David. So these are the four chapters that we see. So coming very quickly to this whole idea of kinsman redeemer, uh, what exactly is that? Uh, to understand, to get a background of that, um, we would maybe it would it would really help if we can look at Deuteronomy chapter twenty-five verses five to ten. I know that's a lot of verses, but it's very helpful to actually read it because um, you know a lot of people skip the passages in Deuteronomy. So it would be good for us to actually go through those verses. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 to 10. If someone could read out, please. She 
Okay, so rather harsh passage uh, where very strictly God commands that uh, you have a duty towards the widows in your family. So uh, the directive given over here is that uh, the widow should be married by the remaining, any, any of the remaining brothers. They should take up the responsibility for her. And over here, the instructions are so clear. If, uh, if, if the brother-in-law refuses to fulfill his duty, and if he refuses to marry this widow, then she has the right to, in fact, go up in front of the elders of the entire community and spit in his face and say, you are not willing to take up your responsibility. So it's rather strong wording that is used over here. And uh, so. Uh, it was an obligation, something that the closest relative uh, would have to do for the widow. Um, uh, I mean, closest relative in the sense, uh, an immediate brother of the deceased. Now, let's look at another uh, verse, which is also, you know, uh, directly has relevance for this. That would be Leviticus 25, verse 25. And if one of us could read out, please. OK, so um, it's told in the beginning of uh, this book of uh, Ruth that when uh, Naomi returns back to Bethlehem, she's, I mean, they, they, uh, the family of Elimelech has been known you know, to all the people. They, everyone knows that family. So when she comes back, uh, they all say, oh, Naomi has come back. So she's a familiar figure. They know about her. And they also know about what condition she is in, that she's penniless. The property is gone because, you know, when uh, when the famine had come, Elimelech had obviously sold the property to somebody. And then with whatever money they had gathered, they went and settled down in Moab. So everyone knows about the condition that Naomi is in. But nobody comes forward to do anything about it. And nobody is fulfilling the commandments given in Deuteronomy chapter 25 and in Leviticus 25. So the closest relative who is there, for Naomi has a responsibility according to Deuteronomy 25 and Leviticus 25. But that person has not come forward. That person is watching from a distance and doing nothing to help Naomi. OK, so that's a very important point that we need to see. So in chapter 3, when Naomi you know, uh, realizes that Boaz is a kind man and he's showing a little kindness, maybe he will be willing to do this obligation. So she sends off her daughter-in-law and says, you know, go, go and uh, you know, manipulate him into, uh, into, uh, into the marriage. So because if she goes over there to that uh, uh, warehouse where the store, uh, grain is stored, and if she lies down over there, then people would say, oh, a young lady went over there all alone uh, and no, it will spoil her name. So Boaz would be pressurized into marrying her. It's actually a very pathetic um, uh, scheme which this Naomi comes up with. Very mean thing to do to your daughter-in-law. And I really don't appreciate that. Uh, you know, uh, But that is the 
silly scheme that Naomi comes up with, you know. So to put pressure on Boaz, I'm sure Boaz, being such a noble man, if she had just gone to him in daylight and said, "No, please, can you uh, help my daughter-in-law and you know my family by doing this?" The poor man probably would have said yes. But she wants to manipulate him into you know into the whole thing. And so uh, uh, Ruth, being such a I don't know, amazing woman. I would have said no if, if 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 someone had said that to me. I mean, I have left my land. I have come over here. I have nothing here. People don't even respect me, you know, because I'm a Moabitess. The way people are uh, are treating me, and now all I have is my good name, my reputation. And now if I go over there to that warehouse and lie down over there, even that little bit, that last one bit of dignity that I have would be lost. But this lady, she only thinks about her mother-in-law. What an amazing woman! And so she goes over there. She lies down in the warehouse, and Boaz is shocked when he finds her over there. And he, you know, he he says, "I will help. I will help." But you know, this this one closest relative. I think I'll go talk to him. If he is not willing to help, then I will step in. I will do what is needed. So we see uh, Boaz, uh, you know, the integrity which Boaz has in this situation. So we, in chapter four, we see the, you know, the the legal discussions which are made between this closest relative and Boaz. And when Boaz says, you know, the land which has been sold by Elimelech to so and so, are you willing to buy it with your money? Are you willing to buy Elimelech's land? So the paperwork will not be in the closest relative's name. The paperwork will be in Elimelech's name because it will be to continue the name of Elimelech and Mahalon. Okay, so the property will be in their name. But this closest relative who is buying that land, all the profits which come from that will obviously be his. You know, he's, he's the one who has to invest in that land and put fertilizer and you know grow the crops and all of that. But all that investment is. Useful in the sense when the profits come start coming, he'll anyway get all of those profits. So very very readily the closest relative he says yes I will redeem the land, and then Boaz says, but one more condition you will also have to marry this widow. You'll have to marry Ruth, and the child that is you know that they that they that they give birth to that child will be known as the son of Mahalon, not as your son. And so, what will happen to that property? That property which this man has purchased, it will go into Mahalon's name, and so the profits also will all go into Mahalon's lineage. So, all the investment which this closest relative has put into this land now, he will not get the benefits. It will go into someone else's title deed. So, the minute that is told, he says, "No, I cannot do this." And in fact, these are the wordings that he uses. Um, where is that? Now in chapter four, Ruth chapter four, verse six, and at this the guardian redeemer said, "Then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it." Very point blank, he says, "No, no, no. You know, I won't really get any profit out of this. So no, it's not something that I want to do." So the kinsman redeemer. The closest relative who was supposed to do the redeeming refuses to do it, and that is when Boaz steps in and he says, "Fine, you know, I will do it. I'll take care." Uh, so, um, just with regard to that, uh, you know, so uh, the sandal is exchanged. So in those days, um, the sandal is exchanged to show that now the inheritance belonged to this person but now the property is going to this person so they would take off the sandal and give it to the other person indicating that now the property has been transferred from so and so to the other person and we have records of this even in the uh, you know in the other cultures of that time now you have these akkadian tablets which the archaeologists have discovered and those akkadian tablets are called by tablets i'm not talking about your you know your medicine tablets those tablets are those um, uh, yeah you know those kind of slabs the stone slabs on which they would write down the edict of the king and things like that so um, those are those stone tablets they were called the nuzi tablets in that there is a reference to this custom where one person would take off his sandal and give it to the other person as part of the legal proceedings to show to all the people that now the property has been transferred from this person to the other person and uh, uh, so these this was uh, one of the customs of that time 
okay um and uh, just another point that i want to make regarding uh, this book of ruth um, you have all these western commentaries saying that this uh, book of ruth is a love story but i don't see any uh, romance happening over here so it's not really a love story if you want to call it a love story it's the story of the love which ruth showed towards naomi it's the story of the love which boaz showed in his kindness to naomi all the love and loyalty is being shown towards naomi because she's the one who is benefiting from this whole thing she is determined she has set her mind that she is going to uh, go on uh, you know for the future generations the name of elimelech and mahlon should go on that is her heart's desire and ruth is willing to go to whatever length she has to go to make this old lady's wish be fulfilled and even boaz is willing to do that and um, so there are two things that we see you know two places where boaz uh, talks about um, ruth and um, i had my bible references written down somewhere can't seem to find them um i think it's probably in chapter 2 i think yeah in ruth chapter 2 verses 10 to 12 is where uh, you know boaz uh, speaks to ruth and he says to her what you are doing for your mother in law is amazing the loyalty that you have shown the kindness that you are showing you know in coming over here uh, leaving your people leaving your land and coming over here to look after her so he admires her and praises her for the loyalty that she is showing uh, her mother in law and then in ruth chapter 3 where she goes to the warehouse uh again he expresses his appreciation for her because he says i am an old man and you are willing to marry me because you know your so that so that your uh, your mother in law can you know have her heart's desire and he says so easily you could have married one you know some younger person but here you are willing to make the sacrifice and uh, so he appreciates her, and that is why he says there is somebody younger there is another relative whose duty it is so maybe he will so he he offers to to be to be the mediator and speak on her behalf you know on behalf of naomi and ruth with that person but of course we see that that person is does not uh, is not willing to fulfill his duty so i would not say that this is a love story i would say this is a loyalty story where a great amount of loyalty is being shown towards naomi and who is naomi naomi is a penniless widow she has nothing left at that point of time and in that culture somebody who is widowed and who has no property uh, their value would have been nothing why are these two uh, people showing such great love and loyalty towards this widow who is nothing who is nobody you know that goes to show the the kind of heart that they had even though she's not really worth anything much they choose to show kindness to naomi they choose to uh, you know fulfill her dreams and god who is watching that is amazed at the level of their uh, you know uh, love and so he chooses to bless them and uh, so we see god's blessing coming upon um, boaz and ruth and uh, so after they get married they are able to have a child uh, and his name is obed and a very interesting thing that we see is that in the genealogy even though you know according to the customs of that time it should have been written the son of mahlon obed the son of mahlon over there we see so clearly whose name is being exalted it is the name of boaz forever and ever the name of boaz is exalted because here was a man of integrity who though having wealth on his side chose to show kindness to a penniless woman and her daughter in law so we see this beautiful details coming out over here in this um, uh, in this book another amazing thing that we see is that the god who said up to the 10th generation nobody will even enter the assembly of the lord the exception is made for ruth because uh, if you look at david david had not reached the 11th generation david would have been how many generations who is good at mathematics here certainly not me he would have been what the 5th generation probably don't know okay let's leave it to the more intelligent people but one thing i'm very very sure 
the david was not the 11th generation but david is allowed to bring the ark into jerusalem with singing and dancing god allows him to honor no god allows david to honor him in that way and then when it when you come to solomon solomon is still not the 11th generation but solomon is the man who builds the temple so god makes his directives he gives his commandments but he's always on the lookout for people with that heart which is willing to love him and follow him and be loyal to him and show faithfulness such people he will make an exception for which is why we have in the book of jeremiah that whole story about the potter and the clay so the lord says i am like that potter if you choose to change your ways i will change my word you know my commandment which i have given i am willing to go back on that uh, not commandment the word of judgment i am willing to go back on my word of judgment and forgive you and you know uh, not allow that judgment to come upon you so in ruth's case we see that the judgment was not brought upon her and her family rather god appreciated what she had done uh, so she was the right kind of clay in the uh, in the lord's hands Uh, so even today we all can have that same choice we can choose to be people uh, who have uh, such an uh, integrity in our hearts that god takes notice you may be insignificant you may be penniless you may not have many skills and talents you may have no great name but when he looks at your heart that draws him it catches his attention and he decides i will make a future for this person we see the same thing even with esther right i mean who was esther she was not even belonging to that particular land she was an outsider a foreigner but because she had the submissive heart she listened to mordecai she was willing to you know uh, live under him and follow his instructions when he saw that attitude of that heart he again arranges a set of coincidences for her life so uh, god is a god we call it coincidences but actually this not just coincidence it's god actually orchestrating the whole thing and making it fall into place so we can be those people so it doesn't even matter whether uh, you know that person is a gentile or a jew god will make an exception for that person if he sees that their heart is right so these are all some of the interesting things which we see coming out of this um, book of ruth mm okay i do have uh, other things to say mm maybe we could just look at uh, you know uh, generally they talk about this term kinsman redeemer with relation to jesus christ uh, so um, they say that boaz was a representation of jesus in the sense the same way boaz redeems the land and uh, is willing to marry ruth in the same way they say that jesus christ was willing to redeem mankind uh, so we have galatians chapter 4 verses 4 to 5 where it talks about um yeah god sent his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those under the law okay so uh, it talks about how jesus became a kinsman redeemer so he did the redeeming part which is the second part the first part says kinsman which means a blood relative so if jesus had sat there in heaven he would not have become an a kinsman of human beings he would still be god eternal god up there and we would still be humans down here with no hope so he had to become our kinsman he had to become our blood relative he had to become a human being like us because only then can he be become a kinsman redeemer um which is why it says in john 114 the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us so that he can become one of us only if he's one of us then he can redeem us as our kinsman okay so that's the that's the parallel that we can draw uh, between boaz and um, jesus christ all right we are at 1140 so if anyone has any questions you can ask otherwise maybe we could look at another one or two things yeah any questions okay here nobody has any questions and no one has posted anything there um what are some things that we can look at ha huh. 
that closest relative maybe they didn't want to disgrace him too much they left his name out uh, the question was uh, is the, cl the closest relative's name mentioned anywhere so no we do not know who he is uh, so he is not mentioned um, no other questions uh. mm. right yeah uh, only thing, yeah, again, in, in that case, uh, they did not want that responsibility. So uh, this is a positive example where someone was willing to come forward and take response. The question asked over here is, uh, isn't this the same, uh, similar to the Judah and Tamar story, where Tamar was supposed to be given her legal rights by being married to the next person, but then the people who married her were not willing to fulfill their obligation. So yes. Okay, if there are no other questions, um, maybe we could just stop with this. I think this should be enough. All right. Um, we'll close with the. Um, okay, so sorry, there is a question here, I think. I don't get it, I mean, what is the... Most of you could hear what's happening here, right? So you're not talking about that kind of access, right? Okay, you're talking about the assignment. All right, I will... Um... I'll ask someone on the technical team uh, to see what the issue is in case it's not showing for the Google Classroom students. Uh, but anyway, the deadline is uh, September 15th. So for the online students, not for those of you here. Okay, so, uh, so uh, yeah, you know, you have enough time and I will ask someone to look into that because I thought I had posted it correctly with following all the rules, uh, but maybe I must have made a mistake. So very sorry about that. Yeah, so I'll ask someone to look into that so that it will open up and you will be able to access it. Yeah, okay, is there anyone over here in this chat right now who actually has been able to access it? Even one person? <laughs> because I did follow all the procedures as far as I know. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll, 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 ask, I'll request someone's help. Sure. All right, let's just close with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for um, the lessons that we can learn uh, from the people mentioned in your word. Thank you, O oh Lord, for putting these examples and these stories here for us uh, as um, things that we can follow, things that we can learn from. So we pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to have integrity and loyalty in our lives. Um, that, Lord, we would be willing to show kindness and mercy not only to the rich and powerful, but even to the penniless and uh, those who are not considered very valuable. And we thank you, O Lord, that even as we uh, do our part faithfully, you always reward uh, those, uh, O Lord, who are loyal to you. Thank you, O Lord, for your great faithfulness. We pray, O Lord, that um, whenever we would need uh, the principles which are there in the story, that you would remind us of these things, O oh Lord, that we have learned today, so that uh, we can practice these things in our own lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I will have this uh, assessment you know, taken care of. Thank you.